The sacrifice made by the Royal Air Force in the Battle of Britain is legendary, and the glamorous image of the fearless airman has become part of our national folklore. But in reality, the summer of 1940 was a terrifying time for many fighter pilots, none more so, perhaps, than the inexperienced part-time flyers of Bristol's own 501 Squadron. By the autumn of 1940, 501 had become one of the RAF's most successful squadrons, having produced 13 ace pilots and shot down over 140 enemy aircraft. But their achievements came at a price, the loss of 30 airmen. With a life expectancy of only 20 hours in the air, it was a feat just to live up to the squadron motto, fear nothing. I felt um, more than vulnerable because of my inexperience, and I, I, was not alone, I wasn't alone in this, I'm sure. Anticipation is probably the worst part of it, in that, you know, where are they, I can't see them, and what you can't see, you get frightened about. At the outbreak of war, 501 County of Gloucester Squadron, based in Filton, was little more than a flying club for part-time auxiliary pilots. Keith Aldridge was working for the Bristol Aeroplane Company when he spotted the squadron training on the runway. Round in the corner of uh, the airfield was the city of Bristol squadron, the auxiliary squadron, 501. Uh, I had a sneaking feeling right from the word go that, uh, you know, I'd like to join that uh, elite band out in the corner there. And uh, as it turned out, I was accepted into that, I suppose, elite sort of uh, company. And privileged you were to uh, be a member of the uh, 501 Squadron. I learned how to fly, uh, but not how to fight. I hadn't got any fighting instinct in me as such. I was merely a weekend flyer who had learned to fly, rather poorly. Although they rated me as exceptional, but uh, that really didn't mean very much. I think all pilots were graded as exceptional, because if they weren't, they weren't accepted. <laughs> Bill Green was encouraged to sign up for an auxiliary unit by his employers and joined 501 Squadron as a fitter before becoming a pilot. He married his fiancée Bertha in June 1940. We thought of becoming a pilot was absolutely beyond my wildest dreams and uh, it was wonderful for me and I, I couldn't believe my luck. Bertha knew that there was a war on and so it was a dangerous time and, and she would know that Mike's my chances of coming through were remote, but she wanted to be married. Bill and Bertha were not alone in their desire to marry quickly, as the outbreak of war had a dramatic effect upon marriage rates in Britain. Vicar's daughter, Mary Lalonde, married her sweetheart, Michael Smith, shortly before the conflict began. Michael was also an auxiliary pilot with 501 Squadron. I met him at a hunt ball. Um, in um, Brockley Cool. He really was great fun, I, I must say. He was typical of what you might think a fighter pilot might be. And because the war was imminent, we got married probably sooner than we would have done ordinarily, but uh, we pushed it forward. Obviously, he knew the dangers much more than me. I was only 21 when I was engaged, and I, I, I must admit, I mean, the whole thing the thought of war was awful to say it now, but was a little bit on the glamorous side. It was, it, there was a sort of frisson of excitement about it all. And, and certainly there was a great glamour attached to the squadron, all of them. German plan for invasion of England. Phase one, knock out the Royal Air Force and its bases. Get control of the air and the sea lanes across the channel. Follow the Blitz plan that had wiped out Poland, the Low Countries, and France. Destroy communication and transport lines. Above all, get command of the air. With the threat of invasion increasing, the men of 501 left Filton for Kent, and experienced pilots from around the country were drafted in to make up the squadron numbers. It was a worrying time for novice flyer Bill Green. 
Well, it was all, it was really quite uh, fearsome, I think, quite frightening, because it was all a strange new world to me, and uh, I knew little or nothing about what was going on, and uh, everybody was too involved looking after their own life to spend time talking to splogs like me. So I was more than green by name and green by nature. And we had a visit from some senior brass hat from divisional headquarters who said that they were expecting, to, we were expecting to be invaded, that the airplanes would be towed by Junkers 88s, and that we were to try and destroy the towing aircraft. And when we fired at the gliding aircraft with the, the troops in it, we were to fire until we saw blood coming out of the hinges of, of, of the frame of the door. After just three hours experience in a hurricane fighter, Flying enthusiast Keith Aldridge got his first taste of aerial combat. The alarms went that the uh, Germans were bombing the airfields around. And I think it was the station commander saying, you got pilot? And said, well, get, take this one off, get it off the ground. So off I went and got, took it off the ground. I didn't know where I was going, but I thought, well, hang around somewhere near the airfield. If they're going to bomb the airfield, I might, might, might see them have a squirt at them, I suppose. I eventually did. I, I met up with a Mr. Smith 110, I think, uh, up on his tail. And I was going to fire at him, and um, he suddenly did a turn. I wasn't ready for his doing a turn, so <laughs> he must have been laughing his head off. Newlyweds Michael and Mary found life apart difficult, but wrote to one another often. We, we, both of us, he there and I here, um, used to watch the postman come. So we were telling each other how much we missed each other and how much we loved each other and, uh, you know, how long would it be before we saw each other, all that sort of thing, as newlyweds would. And funnily enough, Michael was on a 24-hour pass and the phone went and he said, I'll bet that's the mess. And it was. And, um... They flew out that afternoon. The squadron soon began to settle into a routine, and the pilots learned to dread the ring of the telephone, which to some became a portent of injury or death. The life that we lived was sitting in, or laying in a, a, a dispersal tent, with the airplane sitting around outside, with the parachute in and the harness straps in position, ready for you to run out and jump in and buckle yourself up and get off the ground when the telephone rang and you were told to scramble. Most of the time that I was sat there, you were hoping that it wouldn't ring because it, the ring of the telephone possibly meant that you were going to be scrambled and you were going to be having to get into the air to face enemy aircraft and possible death or wounding or whatever. I did fear it. I hoped it would never ring. But it did ring more and more frequently. As the Luftwaffe increased their raids, the squadron was often scrambled several times a day, and dogfights with German fighters became common. It was a time of intense pressure, undoubtedly. Basically, you start putting tighter and tighter turns. Uh, and the, the time comes when either he knows that he, you're catching him closer, or you know it, he's turning inside you for some reason or another. But uh, when you fire your guns, then you will smell the cordite. Even though they're in the wings and far out from you, you can smell the guns. And you can hear the rattle of them because you're, you're putting out, what is it, 1,300 rounds a minute from each gun times eight, eight times 1,300. That's a lot of blooming. A lot of blooming bangs going off. Despite the popular image of a happy, unified squadron, many pilots remained solitary figures. With colleagues being killed daily, many preferred not to form close friendships. For 501's part-time pilots, this meant having to learn their skills the hard way. You'd have thought that uh, the, the old pilots would have said, well, look, this, this, is, this is the form. This is how you will come up and, and, and dogfight with me or whatever. That would have been an experience which would have been, uh, made me a better pilot, nothing else. 
I felt um, more than vulnerable because of my own experience. And I would also value somebody telling me a bit of how to fly the airplane effectively to avoid being shot out of the sky. Bill Green's worries were not unfounded, and after only nine days in combat, his inexperience nearly cost him his life. The weather was bad, the cloud was quite low, and I didn't think there was any hope that we would, A, have bombers to attack, or that we would be able to get off the ground to attack them. And I, was, I sat down and wrote to Bertha, saying that she, I didn't want her to worry, and she certainly didn't need to worry that day because the cloud was so low, we certainly wouldn't fly. When, uh, uh, at six o'clock in the evening, we were scrambled. I saw absolutely nothing, and suddenly there was a crash of glass. Something crashed through there and made a hole about as big as, uh, larger than a tennis ball, nearly as big as a baseball. I, I heard the glass falling around my feet, and uh, I realized the airplane was finished. The, the stick was just like nothing, and I, I realized I had to get out. I uh, already had the hood back, and I got as far as um, taking the weight off my bottom, on my feet, when suddenly, pfft, I was out. Pilot Bill Green had flown in combat with Bristol's 501 squadron for just nine days, when his hurricane was shot down and he was forced to bail out. As he fell to earth, Bill became entangled in his parachute. I was quite certain I was gonna die, and um, I was searching for my end through my thoughts of Bertha. I was continuing to try to push the parachute back. I thought forlornly, but the wind must have got under one of the folds and kicked the parachute open, and it kicked me back. And the quietude of that situation hits you more than any noise you could ever hear. And the whole thing was absolutely wonderful. I realized I was alive and uh, looked, looked around and saw the pylon cables level with me, realized I was near the ground, collapsed my legs and bent my knees and bang, I was on the ground. Bill's chute had opened just 300 feet from the ground. It was a miraculous escape, but the risk of being killed was increasing daily. Flying on patrol with 501 Squadron, Keith Aldridge found himself on collision course with the Luftwaffe. The biggest formation of bombers I've ever seen. And I'm with 11 other pilots in fairly close formation, heading straight for them. I've got my finger on the button and it's firing, and these bombers are coming past in a flash, it's, it's, the whole operation is only three, four, five seconds of the uh, the utmost, I suppose. Five seconds of firing, uh, and you're through. And I, I think I probably closed my eyes the whole time through. Um, and when I come out the other side, I can't see anybody. I can't see any aircraft, none of my own aircraft, none of the enemy aircraft, they've all gone. Keith thought about pursuing the bombers when his plane was hit and burst into flames. I was interested in, in getting out no matter, because uh, when you've got flames coming up from your feet through up over your face, uh, you aren't thinking very clearly, at least I wasn't. So I peeled out over the edge, and uh, as anybody could have told you, you hit the tailplane on the way out and you, uh, if you're lucky, you only hit your arm and break your arm and shoulder, which happened to me. Uh, and then I'm free falling. And there's a moment of uh, waiting for the canopy to open, and it does with a bang. The parachute pulls you up from uh, 130 miles an hour to five miles an hour in no time flat. And uh, inside no time at all, I was in hospital being treated. I was not, not far from Maidstone Hospital. And they treated me for burns and splintered me up on the big body cast with my elbows all stuck. So that was my 
my Battle of Britain. Traumatised by his experience of being shot down, Bill Green returned home to Bristol. I had only been married in June. It was the first time, really, I'd lived it uh, with Bertha's parents, I think. I was in bed, and I awakened to realise that I'd wet the bed. And I, I'd sat up in bed and shuddered like this. And I was so embarrassed being newly married, sleeping with my wife in my in-law's home. And um, I'm sure that it was the, the reaction to the fall. Not all pilots in the squadron were as fortunate as Bill and Keith. Michael Smith was shot down over France. In those days, we had uh, a little postmistress. It was a little small village. And we had a little postmistress who always knew exactly what was in anybody's telegram. I mean, she used to come up and say to my mother, I'm very sorry that your aunt is ill, as she handed. But this particular time, she came up um, in tears. That was middle of the day on the Monday. And I didn't get back home uh, to my parents' house until about five. And it's a funny thing because I'm not in any way psychic, but as I drove up the drive, my father had opened the garage doors, which is a thing he never did for me. I mean, I had to open them myself. And I wondered, I, I had a sort of funny feeling that things weren't quite as they should be. And of course, when I went in, uh, he told me. Mary was told that Michael had been killed in combat. They had been married for just seven months. I did, of course, burst into tears. And I remember saying, no, no, it can't be, you know, it can't be. Um, and after that, I went into, really, into deep shock. In fact, such a shock that I, I lost my voice for two weeks. I couldn't speak at all. It never occurred to me, somehow, that anything would happen. It shows how naive, you see, I was, but I suppose, like everybody else at that age, it, it, it never occurred to me that um, such a tragedy would happen. Bill Green left 501 Squadron and spent several years as a flying instructor, but he was determined to prove himself as a fighter pilot. I had thought during the Battle of Britain that my inexperience ill-equipped me, well it did, it ill-equipped me for doing what I had to do, so that I was shot out of it and wounded before I had a chance to prove to myself and anybody else that might be interested in my capability. I didn't want to leave this world with there being a doubt on my courage or my ability to fly in combat. Bill returned to combat and flew many successful raids over France. He was eventually shot down and spent the rest of the war as a POW in Germany. I was no hero. I know now that I was not a hero. You had to do the best you could under the given circumstances. And I, I feel very privileged to have been one of those people who happened to be there at the time. After the war, Keith Aldridge continued his passion for flying, and he spent many years as a glider pilot. But he remains haunted by his experiences of combat. There were a lot of heroic people in the Battle of Britain, but I wasn't one of them. No way. I think I had qualms about killing people. I know, in retrospect, I had a lot of qualms about killing. Uh, I'm not a killer, I don't think. I certainly don't enjoy killing. And the times that I have killed and known I've killed, they are times which come back to haunt you and you're never the same man since. Mary spent the rest of the war as a physiotherapist, treating troops at Winford Hospital. 
She eventually remarried and now lives happily in Bristol. She still has the letters Michael wrote to her over 60 years ago. The letters I had from him, which I think there were about 20, I kept, of course, and have still got them. Uh, it meant a tremendous amount to me. But of course, you've got to remember, I had all those letters before he was killed, except the last one, which um, he gave to my father, which he called an iron ration. So obviously he knew that this was the letter to be given to me if anything happened to him, which of course my father gave me straight away. My darling, dearest angel wife, this, as my precious wife knows, is just by way of being an iron ration and only to be opened when she is feeling very lonely and depressed. So I shall start off with a short prayer that she will never even open it. Whatever may have happened from now till the time you read this letter, just remember that your husband literally worships, adores, and loves you more than it's possible for him to tell you. And his one big prayer is for the time when he can come back and look after his precious wife and make her always happy, laughing and singing. At the very time you are reading this, darling Mary, he will be thinking of you. Keep the million dollar smile, there's my darling, from your very loving husband. When I reread it, um, I didn't cry, not after 64 years, but I was sad. It, it did sadden me, and I've had a very happy life since. But it's something that um, was an episode in my life that will never be forgotten. And in fact, that I was, um, sounds funny to say perhaps, but that I was really very proud of. I was very proud of him. Uh, he gave his life for our, the country, for me, and hopefully he thought, I'm sure, for peace forevermore. The book, The West at War, 1939 to 1945, published by Sutton Publishing, is available from all good bookshops, price $14.99.